In the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, this invention that you see in front of you uh, was referred to as the horseless carriage. Of course, with time, people started calling it the carriage or the car and completely forgot about the horse because at a certain point in time, it became irrelevant. What we today call the driverless car might as well be called the car in the future where we will completely forget about the driver's seat. How are we close to that future or how close are we to that future and what it holds to us are some of the questions that, that I attempted to answer through my research project. It's an award-winning research project that looks at the effect of autonomous vehicles or driverless cars on urban development and real estate. So I tried to answer three key questions. The first question is, is it really coming? Is the technology is prepared and basically ready to go? The second question is looking at who's reacting to that and how are they reacting? And the third question is, what should we learn and what can we do? So going back to the first question and looking at the technology itself, uh, in 1989, what you see in front of you, this van, uh, was reported as one of the first, or the fir if not the first, autonomous vehicle or the first car that drives itself. It was built in Carnegie Mellon University in the US uh, by Dean Pomerleau and his colleagues. And it was, of course, very slow at the time, probably slower than me walking to this uh, carpet, uh, 1.8 kilometers per hour. And it has the computing power that is equivalent to one-sixth of the computing power of a modern Apple Watch. So this is six times uh, 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 higher in computing power than this van. Of course, this was more than 30 years ago. So, and because the system, or this artificial intelligence system, is built on machine learning, which means it's a set of algorithms that helps the machine or the artificial intelligence system to learn from examples and by experience. So we have reached a point nowadays where this technology is uh, actually ready to go. In fact, there are some cities around the world uh, that are testing these, uh, the, the autonomous vehicles on their streets, and few of them have actually uh, citizens who are using the autonomous uh, vehicles commercially. So, uh, the, uh, some people would ask me, why are you excited about driverless cars, and why it's important? Here's why. Because the current transportation system is not efficient. Owning a car is not efficient. Let me tell you why. A quick question here. So who has a car that is parked outside right now? Raise your hand if you do. OK, a lot of you. So that's the point. The whole point of adopting this technology is to promote the ride-sharing model, which we, where we all share this as a service instead of owning a car. Guess what? The car spends around 90 to 95% of its lifetime parked, which makes it one of the most underutilized assets one can own. And in, in a busy downtown in a typical, in a typical city, uh, parking covers around 25% um, of the land area, of, a, of the very valuable land area. So moving to the next question and looking at who is reacting and how are they reacting to that, I just wanted to share two quick examples. One is from our region, from the UAE, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and the second is in the US, specifically Arizona. So Dubai has a plan to have 25% of all the trips in Dubai to be autonomous or driverless by 2030, which is an ambitious goal. Abu Dhabi, on the other hand, or the investment arm of the government of Abu Dhabi, have jointly with other investors invested a total of $2.25 billion in a driverless technology company that works actually in Phoenix, Arizona. So this company is currently providing its commercial services to the citizens of Arizona, which means you can download an app if you're there, uh, order a car, comes to you, of course, without a driver, drops you wherever you want, and go around to serve other people. 
And that's the point. You don't need to own a car and you don't need to have that much parking spaces in valuable, uh, uh, in, uh, co covering valuable land area in, uh, in our cities. Uh, actually, Arizona or the city of Chender, Arizona have gone the extra mile. So they had looked actually at uh, parking requirements and they have done a, a change in their uh, zoning building code or zoning code to allow developers to remove up to 40% of the parking spaces in new developments and w w where they will be able to add uh, new leasable units, which makes it very much financially feasible for developers. So this takes us to the last question, which is, uh, what should we learn from all these examples and what can we do? So I tried to quantify the effect of autonomous vehicles or driverless cars on a typical uh, real estate project. So uh, we have took this um, actual development, or actually it's a, it's a proposed development in the US. It has 70 residential units and of course 70 parking spaces with a ratio of one to one. Uh, and try to follow what Phoenix, Arizona is doing, or sorry, what Chandler, Arizona is doing. By removing some of the parking spaces, not 40%, but 33% of the available parking spaces, and try to add more leasable units. And we actually were able to add four units times five floors. That is, that's a total of 20 more leasable units which is amazing for the developers because they have more income and potentially more property value because it's linked to the income. And for cities who, are, uh, um, who have property uh, taxes, that will be uh, a great news as well. But when I reached this conclusion in my research, uh, I stopped for a while and thought to myself, who really matters? Like, the developers are happy with that, uh, with that change, but what about the people who are actually living in these spaces? What about the people who cannot afford living in such spaces? So I came with a suggestion that if any government would do something similar to that and will allow developers to remove parking spaces and add units, let's say 20 units in this case, we'll have to tie that with an affordable housing scheme, which means for example, half of these additional units, let's say 10 units, should be half of the market rate for low-income people to benefit from it. And this suggests a path of thinking that we have to promote to look at, um, to look at the human progress, the progress of all. So the future seems exciting and new technologies are changing our daily lives faster than ever. So if we in this room have the privilege to experience new technologies and uh, have the privilege to experience the positive impact of these new technologies, others out of this room may not. So keeping in mind social equity, we have to prepare ourselves, plan and act fast because the rate of technological advancement is exponential and it's not linear. I would like to leave you with a quote uh, from William Gibson, who once said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Thank you.